So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great start of the week. Uh, feel free to ask questions, interrupt me anytime when we are having the lectures here. So uh, as you've seen during the lab sessions, uh, we try to split things so that there is a part which uh, goes directly into the material we cover during the lab sessions. And we have typically something like between 30 minutes to 45, 50, depending on questions and so on, at the beginning of each lab session, where we try to uh, give a kind of overarching view and what are the essential uh, elements in a specific set of exercises we are solving. Now, this uh, week, uh, towards the end of the weekend, uh, I'm also going to uh, upload the first project. And as we said, many of the exercises are linked with uh, the projects, and that, which means that you can actually reuse many of the things you've seen in the exercises in the projects. So typically for this week, exercise two and three, where you're setting up the train test splitting and you're playing around a little bit with scaling. These are elements which you will actually need in project one. So yesterday and on Tuesday, we had three takeaway messages. One was about gradients, which we discussed partly last week. And gradients are things which we are going to live with throughout the semester. We will have to calculate derivatives and gradients of the cost slash loss function, which we have for a specific system. So that's something which we cannot escape. We will have to scale the data. This is something we will always do, whether we do the standard scaling, where we subtract the mean value from every column. This is something which can reduce the impact of outliers and give us a better mean squared error. And then we have other types of scaling where we can have a minimum maximum scaling, which is pretty common because often the data can vary a lot in magnitude, which means that we can, for many of these methods, which in practice end up being a, a series of matrix, matrix, matrix vector multiplications or matrix inversions. Many of these methods here, they suffer from the possibility of loss of numerical precision. So scaling the data is something which can dampen that, and it can often also lead to better mean squared errors. So these are technicalities which we will have to include irrespective of what kind of method we are using. And obviously this is something you will use in every single project here. So scaling the data, splitting in a train test and eventually validation, and then calculating gradients. So these are the kind of uh, ever returning themes, which you will see in all the projects. So to get used to it is something which we hope we can get started with as soon as possible. Now, uh, the topic today sounds a little bit strange because we're going to look at the mathematical properties of the ordinary least squares, but we're also going to introduce another regression method, a linear regression method, which is called ridge regression. And then we're also going to look into another one, which is called Lasso regression. These two methods are actually methods which allow us to introduce a new parameter, which we can tune with the hope to get a better mean squared error. So this is gonna be our first encounter with hyperparameters. Now, there are many of you may get disappointed and you are right in being disappointed when you're at the end, you realize that what you're doing is you're tweaking something which is a multi-parameter function and you are going to keep adding more and more parameters. Some of these parameters are very well motivated while other ones are just very ad hoc. So there's one which is called clipping gradients. So in deep learning, we have a problem with gradients which can become very large. And then there is just something which is called clipping the gradient. That means that if it gets too large, you set it back to a smaller value and then you keep it right. So you may ask yourself, where's the mathematical justification for that? There is no, it's just a practical recipe. So uh, some of these are more motivated like ridge and lasso, which we will encounter today. But actually the ridge regression was introduced because the matrix you want to invert 
in ordinary least squares may not be invertible. So the exercises we had, exercises two and three, there were exercises where we just had a polynomial approximation. And this is normally a case where we won't have problems with matrix inversion problems. So the matrix is normally invertible. But basically all the data which we will encounter may have dependencies between the, the different types of variables or features. And that means that the matrix may actually not be invertible. And the standard trick which was used was actually to add a small tiny argument along the diagonal of a matrix. And then the matrix is suddenly invertible. This is a trick which has been used throughout the years before people came up with the singular value decomposition algorithm, which actually allows us to calculate what's called the pseudo determinant of a matrix. So the singular value algorithm is something which many of you may have seen, uh, but you may have forgotten it because it's often not a main theme in linear algebra, but it's actually the best, if you're asking me what is the best linear algebra algorithm ever, that's the singular value decomposition. And we are gonna use that also to get some more insights about the mathematics of ordinary least squares. So that's the aim today. So it's gonna be more about the mathematics of the methods, but hopefully this is something which we can link also with a statistical interpretation. Like the second derivative of the cost function for the ordinary mean least, ordinary least squares. No, yeah, ordinary least the, uh, that method gives us a, a derivative, a second derivative, which is proportional to the covariance matrix. So we're gonna introduce some statistics elements as well. And next week, we are going to do a little bit more statistics, which will also be needed for project number one. Any questions so far? Things which are unclear before we go into today's topic? So I'm gonna do a mix of uh, slides and whiteboard. And uh, one thing I just wanted to remind you about before we begin is the, uh, uh, some of the basic links. I, because I know that some of you were a little bit confused where to find the videos of the lectures. So if you search for this SDK, uh, I just wanted to link that one to you. So if you go to the semester page, and you look at the schedule, what you will find when you look at the schedule here is that every time we have uh, finished the lecture, I'm gonna upload the video and you will find the link there. So this is something which for those of you who have not studied at the University of Oslo, uh, there is a useful feature on this lecture notes, no le lecture schedule. You can actually subscribe to these activities. So you will get a message uh, on your cell phone or your email uh, about changes of classroom and small things which have changed on the on the schedule. Now, I will also put uh, the link to the videos in the lecture notes from that specific week. So if you go back, uh, so late, later today, uh, if you then go into the lecture notes, which are here displayed as a Jupyter notebook, if you go into the lecture notes for this week, you will find a link later today to the video. Now, the link which you will get, the first version of it is gonna be without subtitles. Now, Google has uh, spent a lot of money to make uh, subtitles from speech. So there's a lot of machine learning algorithms which have been perfected. So the subtitles are typically produced between two to 10 hours later. So then you will also have subtitles. And these subtitles can then be translated into at least 12 of the more world used languages, Arabic, Chinese, uh, I think German, Italian, Spanish, and so on. Any questions about these practicalities? And just use the Discord channel. We've uh, made a permanent Discord channel, which you will also find in the uh, in the uh, on canvas where we put announcements as well and the discord channel is an ex excellent way to communicate 
Now, what I want to do now is to, after these introductory words, I wanted to go into the material for this specific week. And uh, the uh, topic which I want to start with is actually is about the interpretation of uh, the uh, ordinary least squares. So let's just scroll down a little bit till we get to the material for Thursday. So the first part of the material, which you get every week, is something which we hope you will have time to look at, and it's normally relevant for the solution of the exercises. And then you will find the lecture notes material uh, after that. That will be the second part. So uh, one of the things which I wanted to just quickly say here, before we switch over to the whiteboard, is a little bit about the mathematical interpretation of uh, ordinary least squares. So if you look at the equation which we found, uh, which gives us an optimal parameter beta, is given in terms of this matrix inversion problem. Now, the, uh, as we said before, the hat over the beta means that we have the optimal parameters after the minimization. So that means that if you now go back and look at your model, and this is, so the training or learning is here by a deterministic algorithm. So that's the machine learning part. And then you have a model which is linear in the unknown parameter beta, and that's why we call it linear regression. And then we can rewrite this in terms of this matrix here. Now, this matrix has a nice property. If I square that matrix, that matrix is equal to itself. I'm gonna show that on the whiteboard. What does it mean that a squared matrix is equal to itself? What kind of matrix is that? So these have some important names. So today is gonna to be a lot of linear algebra, guys. Yeah? That's a projection matrix. So this matrix A actually projects out specific components. And I'm gonna show you some simple examples pretty soon here. So what that means, is that you can rewrite uh, your model, this model Y, which you have here, in terms of a matrix, which now projects out specific components of Y. So this matrix A is then defined by the column vectors of the design matrix X. So that means that you have a projection of the exact value. And clearly, if the matrix X is an orthogonal matrix or unitary matrix. Does anyone remember what that unitary an orthogonal matrix means? Yeah? That the column vectors are uh, not dependent. That is correct. But what happens if I take the transpose of an orthogonal matrix and multiply it with itself? What do we get then? the diagonal matrix, that's what we get. And that's an extremely useful property. So one thing, which is a very useful thing, if you want to check that your code is running correctly, if you're a little bit unsure about where the bug is, uh, whether this is in the design matrix or not, one thing you can do now is simply to define this X transpose times X to be a orthogonal or unitary matrix which means then that if you do that, what happens if we now scroll down here, if you assume that, so this is a property of a unitary or orthogonal matrix, is that when we take the transpose times the matrix, we get the identity matrix. And that means that this A is actually equal to the identity matrix. And that means again, that your model is exactly equal to the, output data you want to reproduce. And that would give you zero error. So in case you have some problems with your code and you're not sure whether it's generating the correct things, this is one useful test. So just replace the design matrix times X and with a set transpose with itself with a unit matrix. And then you should actually get a, a zero error. And you can see that immediately if you plug in the residual error, which is actually Y minus Y, this can then be seen 
as a projection of y onto the orthogonal component of the space defined by the column vector x. So when I take this one minus this projection, that gives my, me an orthogonal space. So let me quickly remind you of uh, what this means by a simple example. Is that okay? Or is it too trivial? Let's do a simple example then, right? Eh? So let me just do that. I need to change my whiteboard to my whiteboard. So if you now think of a, uh, a, a very simple case, you could have a system which contains only two vectors. So we are going to define a vector x0. Which is equal to one zero. And then I have a vector x1, which is just zero one. And you see now that if I take x0 with x1, this is equal to zero. That should be pretty straightforward to see. Now I can now define a projection operator, which is given by this basis vector, which I have defined. So I could define now a matrix P0, which is going to be X0 times X0 transpose. So I'm sneaking this in to remind you of the, the outer product. So the first one is an inner product. The next one is an outer product. So in this specific case, what you would see then when you do the, the algebra is you get one, zero, zero, zero. Then I could define a new operator or matrix, which is given by X1 here. And that gives me zero, 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 and one here. That's the outer product of two vectors. If I square these, they're gonna be equal to themselves. And these matrices are pretty simple. So you see that immediately. If I square P0 or P1, they have to be equal to themselves. I guess that's pretty obvious to see because you just have one. So if I take P0 squared, this is equal to P0. And if I take P1 squared, this is equal to P1. So with a matrix like this, you can perform operations. And suppose now that we have this orthogonal basis, X0 and X1. So these are the only states which exist. And I can now make a linear combination of these two, which is pretty common. So I have an orthogonal basis, and then I can expand a new basis in terms of the orthogonal basis. Yeah. The hat means that this becomes an operator. So this is not the optimal matrix, but this indicates that this is an operator. So you can think of operators are often translated in terms of matrices. So I should actually have written a P hat here. Then I could now define a new uh, element, which I call uh, alpha. This is a new vector. And I can write this as a constant A times this X0 plus a constant B times X1. So I've defined just a linear combination. So this is a new vector. And when I bring them together, my new vector is actually going to look like A and B. That's the new vector. It's a linear combination of the two previous ones. Now, a projection operator projects out a specific component of the vector alpha. So if I take this uh, P0 and act on alpha, alpha is a vector, then what I have is 1, 0, 0, 0, acting on A, B, so which is simply A, 0, which is A times X, 0. So what we are saying now is that P0 
projects out x0 times a constant. So when we go back to this definition of the uh, uh, ordinary least squares and look at this matrix interpretation, what we're actually doing now is that we are projecting out specific parts of the original output vector. So if that x transpose times x is a, an orthogonal matrix, then we are going to get that the output is equal to the model which we have designed. But in basically all cases, we don't know what the model is or what the function which represents i, y is. And that means that we will always end up with uh, something which is different from the output we want to reproduce. Okay, any questions? So this is just an example of a projection matrix or projection operator. So it operates on a vector and it projects out a component of that vector. And another thing which you will see as well is it, if I add this P0 plus P1, this is just one, one, zero, zero. So this is a completeness relation. So I get the unit matrix. So that's the completeness of the, the space which I have. So some of you may have studied quantum mechanics and these are kind of basic elements in quantum mechanics. So let's go back to the, uh, to the slides a little bit. So I'm gonna shift a little bit back and forth here. So when, I, uh, when you look at what we have here, it's the, uh, going back to this definition. So this is a projection and this projection or projection matrix or projection operator, this is now defined by the column vectors of the design matrix. And what we have when we take the identity matrix minus that projection operator, that is actually the space which now is orthogonal to the vectors defined by the column vectors X. Going back to this definition, which we had in the, in the, on the whiteboard of the, the sum of the different projection operators. Okay. So now one of the things I wanted to say a little bit, so I'm gonna use slides in the beginning here because uh, one of the main reasons is that I will not uh, go through the theorem for the singular value decomposition. That would be three, four lectures on linear algebra. And uh, what we are going to do is actually use the theorem. And what I wanted to do now is to remind you a little bit about the theorem. So one of the things which uh, we suffer when we do ordinary least squares is that the matrix which you saw, this matrix, if we go back again, this matrix X transpose times X may not be invertible. So in the cases which you looked at in exercises two and three with a polynomial approximation, uh, there is normally often not a problem. But if you have data, let's say on, uh, on specific tumors, as we've been mentioning, then the columns in that matrix X may be dependent on each other. One column could be the surface of the tumor measured in square centimeter. Another column could be the radius of the tumor, whatever that means. And clearly we would expect that these two quantities are somewhat correlated, especially if you look at the mathematics. So that's an example of uh, things which we uh, uh, will face. And one of the standard tricks in the beginning was actually to uh, just add a small number to the diagonals. And you will often see, if you go back into programs from the 60s and 70s, that zero is defined as something like 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus 10. And you will see that in many matrix inversion algorithms, typical, people will typically add this zero, which was 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus 10, in order to get a stable algorithm and a stable inversion. But actually you're inverting another matrix problem. So the uh, thing here is that uh, even if you cannot find uh, the inverse of a matrix or the eigenvalues are zero, 
you can perform a decomposition, which is called the singular value decomposition. And that is going to be extremely useful for us when we want to gain a deeper understanding of uh, ordinary squares, bridge regression, and many of these other methods. So this is essentially what this lecture here today is about. So in regression problems, so if you look at if you look at this matrix here, I'm sorry for the slightly dense slide here. The problem which we face is that the column vectors, which uh, define our design matrix, they may be may be linearly dependent, and this is often called super collinearity. So that means that the matrix may be what we call rank deficient, and it's basically impossible to model the data using linear regression. If you look at this matrix here, you will see that the columns of the matrix are linear dependent. And you see that since the first column is the row by sum of the other two columns. And the rank of a matrix is the dimension of the space spanned by its column vectors. Hence the rank of X is equal to the number of linearly independent columns. In this particular case, it has a rank two. Uh, there's another thing. Uh, which you can see immediately from this matrix. So even if you have a uh, square matrix, so this was a matrix which has uh, dimensionality four times three, even if a square matrix, a matrix like this one, you see immediately that the determinant is actually zero. So the determinant and its inverse is then undefined. And that means that the, the matrix X has at least an eigenvalue, which is zero. So these are things which you probably have seen back in a linear algebra course. But now I just wanted to remind you, and this goes back to the way people actually fixed the singularity. So if you look at the matrix, what you typically could do then is to just add a constant lambda. Now we are going to rephrase this in a more mathematical proper language. So you can actually define something which is called a Lagrangian. Have you, I assume you met that one back in the mathematics courses. So if you, did you have a problem like what is the shortest distance between two points? Did, did you have that as an exercise? And then you probably had a Lagrangian with constraints and then you could optimize that one. And then you could show that the shortest distance between two points is what we expect, a straight line. So that's a typical example where you put a constraint. And this is essentially what ridge is, if you think in terms of linear algebra. So next week, we are going to see ridge in terms of a statistical representation. And then we are going to assume that the data we want to produce are given by a Gaussian distribution. Whereas the parameter beta, if they are given by a Gaussian distribution, we will get the ridge regression. So you can derive this from two points of view. But the way it was introduced, and I'm not pulling your legs, the way it was introduced was actually by adding a constant. And then you could tune this constant. Now, what you can show is actually by a selection of the constant lambda, which is going to be a parameter we will tune, you can reduce the mean squared error compared to ordinary least squares. It's not always the case, but it can happen. And then we have another method, which is called lasso, which follows much the same philosophy, but it has different ways of adding the constraint. So if you're familiar with, or if you remember back to your mathematics courses on the problems with constraints, that is normally solved by what's called a Lagrangian with the so-called Lagrange multipliers. It may ring a bell, but you probably have seen it in one of the basic mathematics courses because it leads to optimization problem. So the basics, uh, which I'm going to set up now in, uh, in the slides, uh, on the whiteboard, is that you can, if you take a matrix X, you can actually rewrite that in terms of two orthogonal matrices. So even if the eigenvalues are zero, the determinant is zero, which means that you cannot calculate an inverse, you can always, 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 always perform a singular value decomposition. That exists always. And that's an extremely powerful statement. 
So that means that you can actually rewrite a matrix in terms of uh, an orthogonal matrix U, a matrix sigma, which contains the so-called singular values, which can be larger than zero. And then you have some values which reflect the fact that your matrix has a singularity. So these values would be zero. And then you have a new orthogonal matrix V. So we are actually going to use this to extract some deeper insights about ordinary least squares. So let's try to look a little bit. And if you look in the examples in the, in, in the notes here, you will see a little bit more stuff. But the, uh, a typical example like this one, this matrix here can always be singular value decomposed. And there are some examples in the slides, but what I want to do now is actually to bring up uh, the, the whiteboard again so we can slow down the pace a little bit. So the SVD, the way we are going to use it, we are not going to prove the theorem, but we are simply going to use it. So what does it mean? So the SVD. What it means, if I have a matrix now, suppose this matrix is a matrix with real entries, and it has dimensionality n times p, like our design matrix. It doesn't need to be a square matrix. So this matrix can be singular, but we can always singular value decompose it. So that means that I can rewrite X in terms of a singular value decomposition where I have an a matrix U, which is an orthogonal matrix. I have a matrix sigma, which contains the singular values. So U is a matrix of dimensionality N times N. It's a square matrix and it's a matrix which is orthogonal, which means that if I perform these operations, this is going to be equal to the identity matrix. Similarly, the matrix V is also a matrix of dimensionality P times P here. And we have that V times V of T is equal to V times V transpose, and this equals a unit matrix. Now, sigma contains only elements along the diagonal, and these are called the singular values. So sigma is a matrix of dimensionality n times p, so we can perform the matrix, matrix, matrix multiplications. Then it has elements only along the diagonal. And so let's bring this up on the next page. So if we take this sigma, this can contain, this is just an example of a singular value, uh, of singular values. I could have a matrix like two, one, zero, zero, and then I have an eigenvalue, which is zero. So this would be a matrix which now has dimensionality three times two. And in our case, we have, so sigma contains now this singular values where sigma zero is larger than sigma one and goes on and is larger than sigma P minus one, which is larger than zero. So I will have values which are zero as well. And the example which you see here is an example of this matrix sigma. So the elements along the diagonal, they are called the singular values. So let's just look at one example here on uh, what we can do with this kind of analysis. So if you look back into exercise one, what we found was that the second derivative of the cost function for mean squared, the mean squared error, so this is the mean squared error cost function. We found that that one was equal to two divided by N times X transpose times X. So I told you that this matrix is a positive definite matrix. How can we show that? 
So we can obviously diagonalize it. With a singular value decomposition, we can actually show that the eigenvalues are positive. And that's extremely useful because if the eigenvalues are larger than zero, it means that the second derivative is larger than zero. And if it's larger than zero, it's a convex problem. And we know that there is a minimum. And that minimum is the one which optimizes the parameters beta, okay? So let's just look at the singular value decomposition and how we can use it. So what I'm gonna say now is that X is given by this singular value decomposition times V of T. And I'm going to take away this two divided by N. So I'm just gonna look at this matrix X transpose times X. So that means I can rewrite this in terms of uh, the following. So I would have V, I have sigma transpose, and I have U transpose, and this is multiplied with U, and then I have sigma times V transpose. Can I simplify this expression? Any suggestions? Yeah? You can use the orthogonality for the U matrix in the middle, right? So that gives you, if you do that, you know that the orthogonality says that this is equal to a entity matrix. So you can reduce this to V and then I have the Sigma times V of T. Now, if I take Sigma transpose times Sigma, if you look at this simple example we had here, if I take Sigma transpose times Sigma here, what I'm going to get is a two by two matrix. So it's a P by P in general, and it's gonna be Sigma zero squared, which is four. And then I get zero, zero, and one. So this is just sigma zero squared and sigma one squared, and then zero. So what I'm gonna define now is this matrix as just a matrix uh, which contains the singular values squared. So I'm just gonna write this as a sigma squared, in a little bit sloppy notation here. So what I want to do now is actually to look at this eigen or this problem and transform it into an eigenvalue problem. So let's take a closer look at that. So what we did was simply to rewrite X transpose in terms of V and I have this Sigma squared, which now contains the singular values squared. So Sigma squared, is a matrix of dimensionality P times P, and it contains the singular value squared, sigma squared, sigma one squared, and up to sigma P minus one squared. Okay, so remember now that V is a matrix, and every column in that matrix represents an orthogonal vector. So just keep that in mind till we have the question here. So this V is actually given by a matrix where I have the vector V zero, V one, V two, up to V P minus one. And what I have is that V of I transpose times V of J is equal to the identity because this is an orthogonal matrix. So every vector, every column is Represent, represents an orthogonal vector. Now, if you look at the equation which we have on the top, can I transform that one into an eigenvalue problem? How would you proceed? It's a simple trick, but you may not have seen it. So what I want to do now is to find the eigenvalues of the second derivative. Any good suggestions? So think of the orthogonality of the matrix V. So what you would do is simply to take 
x transpose and x, and you multiply from the right with v. So this is v sigma squared times v transpose times v. And the last one is actually equal to the identity matrix. So this looks like a matrix with the vectors, orthogonal vectors. And I can rewrite this now in terms of each single vector. So I have a vector V of I, and that vector is actually equal to V of I times sigma I squared. This is an eigenvalue problem. So when I've done the singular value decomposition, and since the singular value decomposition, the theorem says that all the singular values are positive and they're larger than zero. This is a case where I don't need to diagonalize and convince you that the eigenvalues are larger than zero. Yeah? VI is the given vector which you have. So VI is just one of these guys which you see here. So what I'm doing now, I am performing the matrix times that matrix multiplication, but I'm picking component by component. And if you look at the uh, left hand side, the right hand side, I still have to learn the difference between left and right. It's, if you look at the right hand side here, or this one, which you see here, this is just a vector times a diagonal matrix. So when you set up the vectors, then if you pick a specific component, that would pick out sigma one. So this problem, which you see here in a matrix form, translates into this standard eigenvector form, eigenvalue form, which you've seen many times before. Now, the sigmas are positive, always positive by definition. And that means that the, so what that means is that sigma, since sigma, this means that xt, x, the optimization, represents the, I have to switch to the slide here, other slide, represents a convex optimization problem. Since all the sigmas, Sigma zero squared larger than one sigma. Actually, sigma zero without squaring it is larger than one. But when we square it, it has to be larger than, sorry, larger than zero. So all the singular values are by definition larger than zero. But now we have even squared them. So this is a really a case where we have a clear demonstration that the matrix is positive definite. This means that x tau, x, no, x t times is positive definite. And if the matrix is positive definite, this implies that we have a convex optimization problem and that we are searching for a minimum which actually should exist. So this is uh, one of the things we can do with a singular value decomposition. Uh, after the break, we are also going to look at what it means in terms of these projection operators, which we looked at in the beginning. So we can actually, uh, if we perform the singular value decomposition, you do that once of uh, the uh, design matrix transpose times X, you can then show that the uh, model which you make is given by the product of the orthogonal vectors of one of these matrices. And that's also extremely powerful because then we can understand what kind of projection uh, we can have with uh, the standard ordinarily squares regression. And then we are going to do the same thing with ridge regression. And then we can make a comparison between the two methods, which is extremely useful. I promised you a kind of strange lecture, but I think some of these insights are actually very useful because it gives us a, a deeper understanding of what goes on. But the other thing, which we are going also to look after the break, is the fact that 
this matrix, which you see here, this matrix here can be directly related to the what in statistics is called the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is a measure of the degree of correlations you have among your data set. And the eigenvalues of that covariance matrix are, re represent the variance. And you have the eigenvalues because you have performed a singular value decomposition. So the singular value decompositions give you also the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. And that's extremely useful again, because then, uh, and we will see that later in the semester, there's a method which some of you may have heard of, which is called the principal component analysis. Has anyone heard of that? Uh, quite many. So the principal component analysis means that you set up the covariance matrix, which is this uh, uh, X transpose times X, you diagonalize it, and then you pick those eigenvalues which have the largest value because that's the largest variance. And those which you leave out represent degrees of freedom which you don't want to deal with. So you can reduce the dimensionality of the problem by diagonalizing the covariance matrix. And this is also something which we can obtain immediately by performing a singular value decomposition. So you would probably, I, I'm not paid by the people who develop the singular value decomposition algorithm, but it's a, it's a fantastic algorithm. And uh, the thing is that it simply says that even if the matrix is singular, you can always singular value decompose it. And in our case, it serves as a tool to get a deeper insight about what these methods mean. So essentially what we are dealing with is a projection into a smaller space of the original value Y, which then hopefully keeps as many as possible features of the output we want to reproduce. So take a small break, guys, and feel free to ask questions. And then we just take a small break here. Uh, just a small message before we move on, it's something which I forgot and was reminded of during the break. So when it comes to these weekly exercises, which are not mandatory, uh, there will be classical paper and pencil exercises. And some of you may have time to uh, typeset them using LaTeX or whatever. Uh, in other cases, you may just have a handwritten sheet of paper. The easiest way then is just to take your cell phone, scan it, and upload it. That's the easiest way. Alternatively, if you have a Jupyter notebook, uh, the, uh, you can always insert it in the Jupyter notebook. So one more thing I wanted to say, and uh, this is something which is a little bit delicate, and it's a discussion which has been going on in Norway about what is accepted to use, what you can plagiarize and not. And this is a very delicate discussion. So what I wanted just to tell you all, and in Norwegian, this is called Schölplagering, Fusk, you know, and it's, it has had consequences for many students. So the material which I put online, feel free to use that as you want. So if you use some of the uh, programs as a template, you will not be accused of uh, plagiarism if you use that. I produce all these materials so that you can get faster to the type of insights which we want you to get. So the material you find online, use it as you want. Uh, I obviously would like to, to be cited. So when you write the projects, you need to cite properly. But don't feel intimidated by this discussion which has been going on in Norway about how you use material. Okay? And if you're in doubt, just please, please uh, don't hesitate to ask more or discuss with me. So the material online which you find is as educational material always has been, it should be freely accessible for everybody, period. Okay. So let's uh, uh, look at uh, uh, some of these things which we have with ordinary least squares. And we are going to use the singular value decomposition to make a, uh, 
analysis of uh, the final result. So we have an optimal value, which we called Y optimal or just Y. So we have a Y ordinary least squares, which is our model, or we could call this the Y optimal, or we just call it a Y tinder. And this is given by this vector X times beta. And we know what beta is. So beta is the optimal value. And we found with ordinary least squares using the mean squared error function. Then we found that this beta is given by X transpose the inverse of that one. And then I have X transpose times Y. So that means that I can rewrite this Y. And what we said then is that this uh, matrix which we ended up with is actually a matrix which now uh, is a projection matrix is a project or projection operator which then projects specific components of y so this matrix is the one which we before the break called for a matrix a and a squared is equal to a so this projects out specific components of y defined by the column vectors of the matrix x now, what we're gonna do now is to use the new insights we've gotten with a singular value decomposition. So I'm going to replace X with the SVD. So which is U times Sigma times V transposed. And this is going to give us an analysis where we can actually uh, set up something which is not singular. Because remember now that if the matrix X transposed times X is singular, then this breaks down. With the singular value decomposition, we can actually perform this analysis in terms of the vectors of this <laughs> matrices U of V. And that's extremely powerful because you can invoke the singular value decomposition algorithm and do it just once. And when you do that, you get the vectors for the matrix U and the matrix V, and you get the singular values. So let's... Uh, take a look at how we can do that. So what we get now is that this Y tilde is now going to be, let me just repeat the expression here. So we have an X T X minus one, X of T or Y. And now we are going to rewrite that one in terms of the singular value decomposition. So that is a U times this matrix, which contains the singular values. So that's a diagonal matrix. And then it contains now what we wrote previously. So I'm just gonna use that result. So that is V times this Sigma squared times V transposed. And I get the V times Sigma T transposed times this U. This is a U of T and this is my V multiplied with Y. So this doesn't look like any simplification at all. But what I can do now, I can use the orthogonality of uh, this matrices V and the matrix, matrix U. So let's try to do that. So one thing you will notice is that since this is just a diagonal matrix, so just quickly, a quick reminder, sigma squared is a matrix which just contains the singular values squared down to sigma p minus one. They are all different from zero. And this is a matrix of dimensionality p times p. So the matrix V and V transpose have dimensionality p times p. The matrix sigma itself has dimensionality n times p. And U has a dimensionality of n times n. So U and V are square matrices and each vector is orthogonal. Each column of these matrices are orthogonal vectors. Now, if you look at the expression here, so you see that one is just a diagonal matrix. So that means just a set of constants times the unit matrix. And we know that uh, if I write something like V times I, the unit matrix, or if we have some constants, this is actually given by E times Y, V here, right? Does that sound reasonable? 
So they commute. That's what we say. That means that I can, if I look at the denominator, I can actually rewrite that one. I have a sigma t of v, and I can rewrite that as a v times v of t times the sigma squared. This is a denominator, and that becomes simply sigma squared. Okay? Because I use the orthogonality, the properties that the matrices V and U are orthogonal matrices. So I can simplify the denominator. So this matrix is just a um, unit matrix. Now, there's another thing we need to pay a little bit of attention to. Now. And that is, before we continue, is the uh, product between this matrix and that matrix. Because that is the one which is going to be interesting for us. So one thing, if you now look at sigma squared, if I take the, uh, uh, put that one, this one back in the denominator, this is just a diagonal matrix. So when I invert it, this would just be the singular values divided by, no, one divided by the singular values. So this is something which I can easily invert, right? Because it's just a diagonal matrix. So I can actually put that up and then I can use the orthogonality between V transpose and V and I can get rid of that factor as well. But now we have to be a little bit careful because if you look at these terms here, there's something which happens here. And let's look at that through an example. And let's bring back that the matrix which we looked at before the break for the singular values. It's often easier to see things through example. So in before the break, we actually looked at this matrix, which was two, zero, zero, one, and then zero, zero. So we have a, a, a matrix which originates from a problem where we had a, another matrix which had a singularity. And a singularity means that at least one of the eigenvalues is zero. So you don't get rid of singularities. However, when you now perform the matrix, matrix multiplications, there's a component which is gonna disappear. And that becomes an important result for us. So uh, let us also bring back the matrix U. So this is a matrix, which is a three times two matrix. And then I had that U is now a vector, it is a matrix which contains the vector u0, u1, and u2. And these are now given by u01, no, 0, 0, u01, no, sorry. I am just messing it up here. So I have u00, u10, and u20, and then I have a u of zero one of u one one and u two one and then there's a new element which is u of zero two of u of one two and finally u two two when i now perform the multiplication of sigma transpose times u transpose which is what you have here this multiplication here, what happens when you perform that multiplication is that you actually are going to get rid of the vector u2, simply because the u2 vector is actually going to be multiplied with that. So I'm only left with the vectors which contain information about the singular values. So what I will get then, and now let me just bring up the answer here, so I, I have it. I have it somewhere here. Yeah, what I get then is the following. So I'm going to get a matrix which now has sigma zero multiplied with u zero zero, sigma multiplied with u one zero and then sigma multiplied with u11. One, one. And then I have uh, sigma one 
multiplied with u10. Sigma one is a sigma zero multiplied with u11, and sigma one multiplied with u121. And this is the same as sigma zero multiplied with a vector u zero and sigma one multiplied with a vector u one. So when I perform that matrix matrix multiplication, I'm actually getting rid of the component which corresponded to a value zero along the singular line. So you see now, I'm actually reducing the dimensionality here. I'm leaving out one term, yeah? So I, uh, so sigma one, no, sigma, so it should be sigma zero up there. Now, sig sigma two disappears right? because the sigma two is this one, and that is equal to zero. Yeah. I have some hearing problem because I have both these ones for the recording. <laughs> could could we take it after the break? Is that okay? Yeah, because I I had some sorry for that. So sometimes when you when you're doing the recording via Zoom, you have the headsets, and then my hearing is a little bit limited. Sorry, but you, you said that there were some problems with the multiplications. Oh, it should be zero one, not one zero, right? Is that what? Yeah, sorry. This should be zero one, and that should be u two one. The other one should be there. But what you have now is that you actually reduce the dimensionality. So if you if you go back and uh, look at what we did with the denominator, that has a sigma squared. We are going now to have a sigma times sigma tau here, which will have a reduced dimensionality. And then we're going to have the vector u times the, the matrix u times u of t. So when we bring everything together, what we will find is the following. We will find that this y of tilde is now given by a sum from i equals zero up to p minus one. It doesn't go up to n, the full dimensionality, and it contains the vector ui and ui transposed multiplied with y. So if I had a sum which would go through all the vectors. Then I would have the orthogonality, which would kick in. And that means that my y tilde would be equal to y, which means I would have a perfect model. But what happens here is actually with, the, with these vectors, we can actually show how we can project out specific components. And the thing with the singular value decomposition, when you're now interested only in the p degrees of freedom, is that you actually multiply away the components which correspond to singularities. And this makes life often very, very much, much easier to live. And in this specific case, we have a geometrical interpretation that ordinary least squares is simply given by the sum of these orthogonal vectors from the singular value decomposition, but only up to the components where the singular values are different from zero. Okay, so that's an alternative interpretation. Now, what I wanted to give you now is to change a little bit. And we mentioned that this X transpose times X transpose is something which is proportional with a covariance matrix. So in order to do this, we need to remind ourselves about some statistics. And I told you that in this course, we will actually uh, bring in elements from statistics, but we will not present them in a coherent way. So that means we will not start with the axioms and derive them, but we will often just use them. So let's uh, quickly remind ourselves uh, of statistics, some basic statistics and quantities. 
statistical quantities. So I'm going to remind you of things like the variance, the mean value, etc. So let's uh, quickly do that. And these are things which you may have seen many, many times. So I'm going to define a, an expectation value like this. And this is a moment, a x to the power of n, when n is equal to one, we have the mean value. Uh, sometimes we will see it like this. This is a kind of notation which will often frequent, uh, appear in the physical sciences. And then we have x, which is integrated over a specific domain. And then we have a probability distribution, p of x, x of n, d of x. Now, this probability distribution, if we have a continuous distribution, is normalized. And this is normalized to 1. So these are probably things which you've seen before. And if you have a discrete probability, then you simply have the sum over the different stochastic events. So let's just do that. Just remind ourselves of the discrete case. And we actually put it up last week, but let's just re let, re remind ourselves about it. So in that case, this expectation value is given by the sum, but where we have the probability. So there's this event X of I, and this is to the power of n. Now, in our case, uh, what we have is, is, so this runs in principle of an infinity, but it will actually, I should actually rewrite it, not like this, but X is now defined. So this X of I is defined within the domain of the variables which we have. In our case, we will always have to live with, live with sample averages. And, uh, which means that our X, this expectation value, is going to be given by one over N. And there's a sum over all the cases which we have. And this just contains the observation which we make. And in our case, we have N observations. So X would typically run so this x i runs well, i is typically something which runs from zero up to some n minus one. Now this is what we have to live with. So that means that the mean value of this x, which we could get from a probability distribution, so this is something which we will call the exact mean value. This is different from the sample mean which I denote like this, which is now given by one over n, and this has the sum over x of i. So this is one of the things uh, which we will have to live with throughout uh, all the type of analysis which we're going to make. There's no way we can get rid of that problem. And in most cases, we don't know the probability. And not knowing the probability means that we don't know the exact value. But we can obviously hope that if we have a huge amount of data, that this is approaching, following Bernoulli's theorem, that this is actually approaching the true mean value or the true expectation value. So just keep that in mind. This is the, the hard side of uh, this kind of statistical data analysis life, is that you often are limited by a, a, a very small amount of data. Then, we have something like the variance, which is a very important quantity. So I just write this as a sigma of x here. And often I will drop the subscript x. And then we have a dx, and then a p of x, and then an x minus this mu of x, which is the exact value. So this is normally the standard definition of the variance. And then you have a similar one for the discrete case, but we, will obviously calculate the sample variance. And that doesn't have a probability distribution. So which means that in our case, we will be limited to calculate a quantity like this, the sample variance.
And the sample variance is now given by a sigma x squared, and I put that bar on top of it to distinguish it from the true one. This is given by one over n, and I have a sum of all the events which I have, and this is xi minus, and then it's mu x, the one which I have from the sample average. And this is squared. Now, there's something which you will see basically in all textbooks. And that is that that factor, one over n, is replaced by one over n minus one. And that is because the sample variance has dependencies when you calculate it between different events, which means that uh, in order to avoid that uh, kind of dependence, you put n replace that with one divided by n minus one. And this is called Bessel's number in the literature. Now, what I'm going to assume now is that this sample average, which we have, is as close as possible to the real one or the one we want to approximate. And I'm just gonna put one over n. But if you calculate that quantity using uh, NumPy or any statistics software, that will automatically include one over n minus one. So if your results don't match, that is simply because in all statistics software, from NumPy to R and whatever, that one over N minus one is included by default because you assume that mu of X is not the true sample average, okay? But in the notation here, this is my uh, trait of laziness. I'm just gonna write one over N. And then I'm going to assume that mu of X is the exact average value. But just keep that in mind when you're gonna run calculations. Now, there's another quantity which is extremely useful and that's called the covariance. And the covariance measures correlations between different uh, stochastic vectors or events or whatever. So we would define that if we have a continuous distribution like xi, xj, we have two events, xi and xj, and that's gonna be an integral over dxi, an integral over dxj. And then we have a probability distribution of px and j, pxi and j. And then we have the uh, expectation value, which we're calculating xi minus mu of xi, multiplied with xj minus mu of xj. So that's the uh, standard definition of a covariance. And then there is a discrete variant as well. And then you're simply summing over X i's and X j's. So this is the ideal. Now the covariance has a very important property. And you may have heard about this definition of independent and identically distributed events. This is often shortened to IID. So who's heard of that, IIDs? So with an IID, this expression is exactly equal to the roundest number you can think of, zero. And that is a mesh of correlations between a data set. So if you have independent and identically distributed events, so if XI and XJ follow a Gaussian distribution, and the distribution then is just a product of these two, then we can show that the variance, you know, this covariance has to be equal to exactly equal to zero. So let me just uh, state, say what that means, because that tells us about how correlated the data are. And that's an extremely useful quantity. So one of the things you will often see in machine learning is that people actually calculate the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix uh, or the correlation matrix gives you a measure of how correlated the different column vectors where your features are. Have you heard about the covariance before? Okay, so let me just remind you of that. So if we now move on, so we are now going to look at the case with IID, which means independent variables, independent and identically distributed 
independent and identically distributed. So that means that this probability distribution, Txi, Txj, can be rewritten as the probability of x of i and the probability of p x j and where these functions are the same. So that's a very important uh, uh, approximation. And typically when we now are setting up the data for linear regression, we assume that there was a noise in the data set. And that noise is assumed to be the same for all measurements. And typically what you will do then is to assume that the noise is normally distributed. So that's a very common assumption. That is going to lead, as we will see next week, that the numbers Y, the output which we have, is also normally distributed. And that's a very interesting result. But this has a consequence, if that is the case, then the covariance of xi and xj is going to be equal to zero. And I leave that as an exercise to you guys. This means also that u of x of i is equal to u of x of j. So they are the same because it's the same distribution behind the events which we have. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave that as a small exercise. And next week, we're actually going to have exercises which deal with statistical properties. So you're going to practice a little bit with these things. Now, the uh, sample covariance is defined, if you now go into any textbook in statistics, you will find the following definition of the sample covariance. And uh, the way you would define that is in the following way. So we will define that as a covariance. And we can think of now having two vectors, xi and x or y, or let's just call this x, xi and y of j. So these are two vectors which we have. And they don't need to be correlated. So the definition of that one is now a sum which runs over all the observations which we have and we have k equals zero up to n minus one. And then I have the element x k of i minus mu x of i. And this is multiplied with y. So this is a component of a vector x i and a component of a vector y j. So this is k j minus the mean value of y of j. So y of j is a given column vector of something. Okay, this is the definition you will find in any textbook in statistics. And this is what we will calculate. We will actually have to deal with a sample of observations and then you can calculate the sample covariance. Now, what we are going to do now is to set up the covariance matrix for the design matrix. So if we now take the design matrix, in that case, what we would have would be an X of I and an X of J. That is gonna be the uh, covariance of the design matrix. And let's look at a simple example before we move on here. So let's now assume that we have two vectors, x zero, which is given by the element x zero zero and x one zero. And then we have another vector x one, which is simply x zero one and x one one. So these are the two vectors. And then we have a design matrix, which we defined as X is given by X zero and X one. And as by obvious reasons, it's given by X zero zero, X one zero and X zero one and X one one. So what I can do next is actually to set up the covariance between these quantities. So I could define the covariance of x zero with itself. And that would simply be one, in that case, we have two elements only. 
So I have a sum of a k equals zero up to one. And then I have my x zero, uh, x k zero minus the expectation value for zero. And then I have x k zero minus mu of zero. Now this is an interesting quantity. What is this? Small hint, just going to go back. And you take a look at the sample variance. And then you take a look again at this expression. Is that an, I hope you don't get offended. Sometimes my same questions are <laughs> perhaps too obvious. Yeah. No, no, it's not one. Yeah. It's a sample variance. So this would be the uh, sample variance. So it's sigma of uh, sigma squared, and I'm just gonna write x zero. If I do on the other hand, if I do the covariance of x zero and x one, this is going to be equal one over two. And then I have a k equals zero to one. And now I'm going to do something. Uh, you remember that it's common to scale the data. So the standard scaling is to subtract the mean value for every column. So if I use the standard scaling now, I'm not going to bring in the mean value. Okay? So I am assuming now that I've scaled my data. So that means that this is going to make things a little bit simpler. So I'm simply going to have x k0 multiplied with x k1. So I have assumed that I have scaled the data. So this should actually be an x tilde, a transformed x. But I'm scaling the data, which is a common uh, thing you would do uh, as we discussed in the lab sessions on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So that's the kind of standard scaling which is always done. And what you would get in this case when you do the algebra is that you would get that this is equal to x zero zero times x zero one plus x one zero and x one one. And you will quickly see when you do the algebra that this is equal. So this is actually a, a symmetric thing. It's equal to that quantity. So if I set up the covariance matrix for my design matrix X, I'm going to get the following. So let's do that. So covariance uh, matrix for the design matrix, which is now given by these two vectors, X zero and X one. If I do that, I'm going to get something which I'm going to rewrite as a C, as a function of X. So X is a design matrix. And that's going to be a matrix now because I have uh, two vectors. So this will be a two by two matrix. And this is the same as my variance of X to zero. It's gonna be the covariance of X to zero and X one. And this is symmetric. So the matrix is actually symmetric, X zero and X one. So I'm just writing it the same, but it should in principle be X one and X zero. And then I have the variance of X1. If you go back and there should be a factor of, so in the factor of a half is included in front of the variance and the covariance. So if you go back now and look at uh, what I defined as my covariance, you can actually rewrite this as the following in a more general way, one over n of x transpose times x times x. And remember now that x is a matrix of dimensionality n times p. So this has dimensionality p times p. So that's my covariance matrix. This is, if I use mean squared error, 
This is the second derivative of the mean squared error. So the second derivative of the mean squared error is the covariance matrix. So next week, we are going to see that the parameters beta in the model, they are actually given by an analytical expression, which is the inverse of that matrix. So that's also neat. So linear regression has many of these neat mathematical properties. And if we go back to the singular value decomposition, we know that what the eigenvalues of this matrix are. They are the singular values. And we know the eigenvectors. So this is also something which is extremely useful. And ideally, we want to have these quantities to be equal to zero. So we don't want to have much correlation in the data. But unfortunately, there will be. So with a singular value decomposition, when we diagonalize this matrix, so we don't need to diagonalize it if we have done a singular value decomposition, because then we have the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues by the singular values. So the eigenvalues of this matrix, as we saw, so the eigenvalues, so this has singular values, singular values of x equal u of sigma of v of t as eigenvalues. That's pretty neat. So this was about some of the statistical interpretations of the data which we can make. And so when we set up the, uh, uh, that design matrix, the covariance which we get is the same in this case as the second derivative. And we also know that this second derivative has only positive eigenvalues, which uh, agrees with the variance. So when you diagonalize this matrix, you will get the variance on the long the diagonal. And the variance is always a positive quantity. So that's also very useful. So these kind of interpretations, uh, they give us a little bit deeper insight into what the different methods mean. So the fact that you can get analytical expressions for let's say the variance of the parameters beta means that we can set up an error estimate of the prediction which we make. This is very uh, seldom for many of the machine learning algorithms. When you do a neural network, uh, you don't have any nice analytical expressions anymore. These kind of things will also guide us in uh, now uh, calculating gradients because one of the methods which we are going to use to find the zero of the gradient is Newton's method. I guess, have you heard of Newton's method or Newton Raphson? This is the basic method for finding the zeros of the gradients. So that method will depend on the second derivative. And the second derivative is given by this matrix again, except this factor one of n. So you can actually relate many of these things to many of the things which we will do in machine learning. So not only the statistical properties, but it allows us to get started with gaining an understanding of uh, how the gradients behave because we have analytical expressions for, for the gradients and analytical expressions for the second derivative, which uh, helps us in setting up Newton's method. Then when we move on to deep learning and neural networks, we are just in outer space and we're just lost in space because in many of these cases, we don't have any simple expressions for the derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. But the kind of insights which you gain here are things which pertain to many of the other methods. Okay, any questions? I hope this wasn't too boring. I mean, there are some mathematical connections which are, which I think are neat, nice to look at. So I just wanted to conclude with the pointing to where we will be next week. So we are gonna do some st more statistical analysis. We are going to calculate the expectation values of uh, beta. We're going to link what we have with a statistical derivation. So you can actually obtain ordinary least squares from a statistical starting point. So not from a linear algebra starting point, which we did now, but I wanted also to point uh, going back to the slides to where we will uh, uh, pick up the thread next week. So let's go back to the slides 
And one of the things which we're going to look at, so you will see the same material here, and there are codes as well, which I didn't get time to go through. Uh, but we are going to look at uh, what is called ridge and lasso regression. So we have optimized the first problem, and that gave us neat and nice analytical expressions. Now, one thing, as I said, the cheap trick, which people did in the 60s and 70s, in the previous millennium, or previous century, then was actually to add a constant. So if you look at the notation, this kind of double bar with a two is a norm two of a vector, which is actually the sum of the, the, the square roots. What region regression does is actually to take the norm two of this vector and optimize that problem. So this gives you a cheating parameter or hyperparameter if you give it a nicer name. And you can tune this parameter. And for many cases, you can actually get a mean squared error, which is smaller than ordinary least squares. So that brings you close, closer to happiness because with a small mean squared error, you may say that my model, which I've trained, gives a better fit to the data than ordinary least squares. So mathematically, it means that we are going to optimize uh, that problem which you see here. This problem here will give us an analytical expression, which is very similar to standard ordinary least squares, as you will see down here. So what you're going to get is actually this matrix to invert. And this brings us back to the, uh, to the cheating parameter from the 60s and 70s, where we just added a constant along the diagonal. But you can derive the same equation by using a Lagrangian, which you optimize with a hyperparameter, which can have a constraint. And then in the literature, there are tons of ways of doing that. And two of the most popular ones are lasso and ridge regression. And lasso means that you have a norm one, which is the sum of the absolute values. Now, the problem then is that you no longer have a nice analytical expression because when you take the derivative, and we are going to discuss some of this material. If you take the derivative of an absolute value, and here I drop the vector signs, then you have a discontinuity at zero. It's not defined at zero. So here comes another cheap trick. So many people just put it to zero at zero. <laughs> you will see many. I mean, you, you'll be surprised to see how we tweak things. And, and the, uh, but the problem is that now we have a, a sign problem, and that means that you don't find these nice expressions to invert analytically. Or, sorry, a nice analytical expression to invert, sorry. Okay, too many words. End of lecture, by the way. <laughs> Any, so this is where we pick us up next week. Okay? Any questions, feel free to ask, don't hesitate. Okay, see you next time, guys. So for new online, I'm going to switch off the uh, recording. And feel free to ask questions. I mean, you can send me questions after the lecture or use the Discord channel. And uh, see you next time, guys. I'm stopping the recording and the video will be uploaded pretty soon.